we have a tightly facilitated meeting here because we really want to hear from you. So we need to give you a little bit of background, but we really want to hear from you. So we will take some questions right after Elena's presentation and the left we will save um, for later. Elena, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much to all. And first of all, to Kasia and Silvia and Livio for this really perfect introduction into the topic. So I hope everybody now feels fired up for uh, the uh, Climate Pact and everybody now understands what the Climate Pact can mean. Uh, just to say the start has been very clear. People started demanding more action on a uh, climate pact and uh, on, uh, on, on climate. We have seen young people in streets. Uh, we have seen a mainstream media discussing about uh, scientists' uh, findings. And I think even the COVID crisis shows how much it is important to listen to science, but to understand how I can actually participate in, in that. So first of all, uh, we, have seen that and uh, we have listened to that and you know the top level politician said yeah it's actually important it's quite interesting we do so many policies on trading scheme on effort sharing uh, regulation on uh, on uh, vehicle standards and and the street thinks we have done so little uh, and this just uh, showed how it is important to actually get more uh, people into, you know, thinking about climate behavior and individual action and how much it is important to uh, give them some voice. And this is what I want to say as a first message to all of you is that Climate Pact is beyond legislation. It is when the legislation stops, this is where the climate pact can actually make a difference. And we have been always very shy in uh, the institutions to talk about lifestyles because it means you need to self-censor actually also your own behavior. And you know how it is. It is very difficult. So we need always to start with uh, ourselves. Now, last year, uh, before Christmas, we received uh, a great present. It was the Green Deal, uh, Green Deal Initiative. This is really the first time that the institution starts its program with a green priority. And the Green Deal was meant to bring all these different facets of environmental, economic and social policy into a sort of contract between the society, the policy makers, the enterprises, and so on and so forth. But what we have realized is that whatever you do, uh, however far you want to come with the legal strings attached, you need to add uh, the uh, social movement. And this is where, you know, people come in. And this is where the climate pact has a space. And this is to give everyone a voice and a space to design climate action, to share information, to launch whatever they, they want to launch, to initiate the others. So it's not anymore a sort of typical technocratic machine of, commission proposing and the two institutions uh, adopting and then in few years time we realize that the legislation remain on the book. This is really to advance uh, a lot of it uh, through uh, people's desires, people's activity and people's commitment. So how do we wish to, to go about it? Well, uh, it is pretty simple in uh, our minds, I must say. First, we want to talk about it, you know, and this is how we started talking about concrete actions as to what uh, you can do. And this allows us actually to channel a lot of these hopes and fears into uh, a collective uh, action. So this is important. And let me be very clear uh, right from the beginning about the do's and don'ts. Climate pact shouldn't become a sort of breeding ground for um, climate denialists. We are happy to discuss 
with them and to uh, actually tear down the myths. But this shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't take, uh, you know, the climate park as a space for that. No, we are here to welcome people who are really ready uh, to take up some activities so that Agnieszka from Poland or um, uh, Gabriele from Italy sees what they do uh, as part of uh, a wider action. And then, of course, uh, we need to create what we call a, a European movement, a European wave uh, for uh, a different uh, climate uh, policy that needs to go from the scientific circles, from the uh, technocratic uh, places towards something that is concrete. And I'm sure uh, many of you already participated in cleaning, uh, cleaning uh, initiatives or organized a neighborhood uh, initiative. Uh, uh, during the COVID crisis, many of uh, our colleagues from the institutions actually did organize, for instance, preparation of masks because the government uh, and uh, you know, local authorities sometimes, uh, you know, say, uh, failed us. And this is where indeed uh, the individual action uh, meant so much. So who are the ones that should uh, join this big endeavor of saving the planet, inspiring and talking? So who are those? Well, first of all, uh, these are... Uh, Okay, uh, these are the, the citizens, uh, you know, the, the youth organization networks, the public administrators in uh, regions, cities, local authorities. These are the small businesses or bigger business, uh, non and for profit, because we don't think we should leave the business off the hook. And let me be very clear, this is not a replacement for the obligations that are already on the books. To the contrary, we always believe that a CEO, after he has done his job, he still wants to enjoy clean water and clean air, and he can or she can push uh, her employees uh, to do better. And that's why we have uh, seen so many different and new mobility options offered in many companies. We of course need to link to scientists because they start to be more clear on what to do. They start to converse on um, Twitters, on Facebooks, on social media, and they are much better understood by people like me uh, to know uh, whether what I do uh, really makes uh, sense. We definitely need to involve media because when we uh, look at, you know, the amplifier uh, power they have in both the positive but also the negative uh, sense, uh, we, we really need to talk to them. Um, I'd like to uh, turn back into our virtual uh, uh, circle as we have seen it, uh, Kasha, indeed. So if you want to uh, actually uh, visualize in a, a typical commission, uh, let's say virtual circle uh, philosophy is, first of all, in the middle of it is, yes, I can. Yes, we can. And yes, we will do. So it's from talking the, the, the climate to triggering action and then, of course, working together and, and talking even more about the lessons learned. So really providing for these feedback loops in all that. So testing what uh, can be done and what can be replicated, what can be uh, scaled up. And of course, uh, what will be very much uh, our focus is uh, where we live, so our homes, uh, how we cool, how we heat our, our homes. And there, I must say, unless you have really constructed a house, you will have a difficulty to understand the difficult uh, aspects of energy efficiency, climate resilience, circularity, and so on. But yes, this can be done. Of course, also our movements, you, many of you are biking, walking, etc. So yes, mobility matters very much in, in our lives. So, 
And of course, we will need to talk more about greening of cities and providing uh, more of these uh, lungs of the, of the planet, because unfortunately, so far, we are still on retreat with the green spaces uh, instead of uh, having more and more of them. So yes, we can, and yes, we will do. So uh, just that you see, this will be uh, the, the, the overall logic of uh, how we will go about it. So we have already uh, provided who are you, because uh, I'm sure many of you actually come uh, from, from all these uh, different communities. And allow me to say something very important. We are trying to provide by the end of the year some sort of narrative for the climate pact. But this cannot be written by officials in, in Brussels and not even in, uh, uh, in a department responsible for climate action and others. It needs really to be written by others and elsewhere. And this is why I really call on you to seize the opportunity of the public consultation that we still have until uh, Wednesday uh, this week that is open to all of you to uh, reply and to give us some of the narratives so that uh, the, um, the, the communication from the Commission, so the declaration of intent, what the Commission aims to do, will really recoup as many angles, as, as many views as uh, this rich audience we have today here with us can uh, offer to us. So thank you very much. Hopefully I have given you a little bit of frame and you will be able to fill out today the canvas, the huge canvas that is out there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Elena. Um, Livio, what are the burning questions that we really need to answer so, now? Um, a few comments uh, in the side chat, but most importantly, a question from Fons Janssen, who, um, for which a, an easy reply would be the climate pact. Uh, but basically, he's asking how we would be more, well, how could we make more efficient the meeting ground for all these disparate groups, youth, municipalities, and businesses. Um, and yes, the pact is uh, one short answer for that, but I think we will find out more how to unpack it during the breakout sessions and then in the close. And then the links to the budget recovery by uh, Celine. I think this is also something that we will uh, come back once we finish exploring the topic uh, in the breakout sessions. So I would save that for the closing session. Definitely. Thanks. Okay, in that case, I have a, a question uh, that actually came from our facilitators before. Uh, we explained the link to the Green Deal. Uh, the pact is supposed to be a vehicle bottom-up to deliver on the Green Deal in, uh, and for the Green Deal to have the impact and um, uh, urgency and speed that we need. What about the climate law? What is the link there, Elena? That's a very good question. Um, when I read the, the, the climate law, uh, the climate law is really for the insiders to understand what will happen. But what I want you to understand is the climate law uh, codifies a sort of irreversibility. It means that Europe is serious about going to climate neutrality. It means zero emissions by mid of this century in line with a uh, Paris Agreement. And it means that uh, Europe, once this is agreed, will never turn its back and go back to, uh, you know, dirty uh, transitions or uh, dirty uh, developments. How we will do it, this is the question of the technicalities when you read the proposal uh, by the Commission, is to have a uh, pathways or uh, trajectories to get there because of course if we say today so see you by 2050 for climate neutrality we have seen it it doesn't work so we need to see uh, today in 2030 in 2040 on whether we go there and what will be the role of Europe well Europe will look or European Union, if you wish, we look at what are the member states doing. And one member state will look what the other member state is doing. So it will be very much in the open. 
and the Commission will be entitled to comment on the adequacy of measures. Is that, you know, uh, good enough? Is that fit? And as you know, um, now jumping a little bit on the recovery question is a lot of money will be channeled in the coming months and years through the member states' budgets up to 680 billion will uh, go there for different green uh, projects. Uh, so it is uh, absolutely critical that the so-called green uh, projects will really uh, be green ones. And this is where uh, Europe also helps with classification, for instance, of, of investments. So, but what I want you to leave with uh, on Climate Pact is accountability, responsibility and irreversibility of uh, going for a climate neutral continent. Elena, many thanks. Just one uh, more question. There's several. We will gather all of these, and as I said, we'll either reply to them during the breakout sessions or at the very end. But there is one uh, issue for the scope of the conversation, which I think is important to address right now, and that is linked to adaptation. A uh, participant is asking whether adaptation is part of the Green Deal, because the conversation is all about mitigation and biodiversity, and that could also shape uh, our conversation on the pact itself. So that's something to reply. Maybe Elena. Yeah. Of course, adaptation is part of it, and uh, it's it, again, I come from, from an area in environmental policy where I have done a lot uh, of, on air quality, on, uh, um, on recycling, on uh, biodiversity, and I think whatever policy you take, it just, you know, complements something else and reinforces it. So when we look, for instance, at uh, biodiversity and the building of more green spaces in, in, in uh, cities, it means you are reducing the, the heat island when the heat waves come. And this is very good for uh, adaptation purposes, but definitely also for health uh, of people. So indeed, uh, adaptation is uh, part of all these uh, policies and we should really look how uh, we communicate more and better on co-benefits because this is also the tragedy of comments of environmental policy sometimes that we always do just communicate on a very narrow uh, benefit almost as an indicator you know so much tons of uh, greenhouse gases and it simply doesn't appeal to the imagination of people unless you say this has so and so much impact or this has led to uh, floods in Poland and drought in uh, in, in Brussels uh, so uh, we need to bring these stories together for uh, a sort of understandable whole Many thanks. Um, many thanks, Elena. Um, we also have some questions on job creation and indeed the pact can also be a, a tool for that, also making these connections, but also spurring new action and making sure that the jobs are created in sustainable and uh, in, in sectors that have a future and that don't uh, become victims of the green transition. Um, I, if I may, please, few yes. words on that, fully agree. Many of you uh, who are attending this session today, you are quite young. You know, when you were born, uh, the jobs you were in uh, didn't exist or uh, you, uh, you could hardly understand what, uh, what, what this is. I must say many times I, I don't understand uh, job announcements because they, they bring in very new skills. And this is indeed for the future what is important that the green area or the green space will indeed offer a lot of these uh, green jobs. I was talking to a few local authorities in Czechia and they really need some sort of energy efficiency managers to understand how uh, to renovate uh, the building stock. They, uh, many, uh, you know, um, uh, many uh, member states uh, now need uh, landscape engineers to do the water retention um, policy because they, they, they start realizing that with the drought they will have to deal with some legacy issues like the old drainage systems that have uh, actually uh, dried out uh, the wetlands that provided this, this sort of services. So there is really a sort of 
I would say, even hunger for uh, these competences. We will need much more of astrophysicists like you, leave you to uh, predict, you know, um, to calculate uh, um, in the future, uh, you know, where we, we may be uh, with this sort of development in 20, 30 years. Uh, much more of these applied physics uh, capabilities. We will need much more of high tech people uh, who will be able to develop the new engines of, of tomorrow and much more of these multidisciplinary people who will, you know, link the, the, the chemics, uh, chemistry with physics and with maybe education and so on and so forth. So yes, the future is definitely open to very, very new jobs. Many thanks, uh, Elena, also for, um, for, for this clarification. Um, we'll have plenty of opportunity to discuss this also in the breakout session, so I suggest that we close this. None of the topics that were opened in the chat function are lost because we are harvesting them all, and as I said, either we will uh, reply to them in the final session or we will have a, a Q&A, and these actually will be the seeds of uh, all the future narratives and communications that we will carry out through the pact. So many thanks for those, and I suggest that uh, I pass the floor back to Kasha. Thank you.